Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be here tonight and welcome. Um, tonight, our text is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 and running through chapter 3, verse 6. Last week, we talked about uh, Paul's waiting in Troas, and uh, that waiting was too much for Paul. It was filled with anxiety. He could find no rest in his spirit, he says. Even though he had an opportunity to preach the gospel there in Troas, he thought that was uh, of secondary importance. That the anxiety, the restlessness he felt for the Corinthian response was too much. He needed to find Titus. He needed to hear from Titus what the Corinthians said. That tells us a lot about Paul's heart his love for the Corinthians, his sense of responsibility for ministry and his care for the churches, that he passed up this opportunity in Troas in order to discover what had happened. Now, before Paul tells us what he discovered, which is what he does in chapter 7, beginning in verse 5, before Paul does that, he digresses, if that's the right word, he takes off on a tangent. Maybe tangent is not the best word either. But he shifts the discussion from his travel log, describing his travels and why he made the decision to write the painful letter and, and uh, why he changed his mind about going to Corinth the third time at the time that he thought he might. So he's telling us this travel log. And then in the travel log, when he's about to meet Titus in Macedonia, and therefore learn what the Corinthian response is, it's like a, he puts on a pause here. He holds the drama. And we talked a little bit about that last week as to why he might do that. So tonight, we want to, to look at the beginning, the opening of that digression, that pause, whatever we might want to call it. And it begins with a thanksgiving which is kind of strange in some ways, but it reflects his heart. He's waiting in Macedonia. He leaves Troas to go to Macedonia to find Titus. And just when he's about to tell us what Titus had to say, he says, thanks be to God. It becomes a moment of gratitude for the ministry that he engaged in at Corinth. And by extrapolation and extension, it's a gratitude for the ministry that God has given Paul, the ministry of reconciliation. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 through chapter 3, verse 6. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing him. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not peddlers of God's word like so many, but in Christ we speak as persons of sincerity, as persons sent from God, and standing in God's presence. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward you. 
or toward God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Which is exactly how Paul begins this pause in his travel log. Thanks be to God. Now notice what he gives thanks for right off the bat. He gives thanks to God for two things, basically. The God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. That's one thing. God leads us in triumphal procession. And secondly, that God in Christ spreads in every place the fragrance of the knowledge of God through us. So God leads us and God spreads the fragrance of Christ through us. In other words, we are part of the procession and we are, that we are participants, you might say, in the procession. We are, we might uh, want to talk about exactly what that means, but we are in the procession because God is leading us in Christ. And we are instruments by which the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of Christ, the beauty of Christ, is spread abroad in every place. Thanks be to God. Now, that first phrase leads us in triumphal procession. That can sound a little off because a lot of people read that in the sense of, of um, that we are the triumphant ones that we have triumphed, that we're in a victory parade, and that we are kind of the fellow soldiers with Christ in the victory parade because we've uh, accomplished it our, along with Christ. But that's really not what Paul is getting at here, it seems to me. The triumphal procession seems to allude to the practice of Roman generals or Roman emperors coming back to the city and leading a procession, a triumphal, victorious procession, where the, the king or the emperor is at the head of the army. But the procession is filled with the captives, the prisoners, which often would end in death for these prisoners at the end of procession. So I think Paul is talking about a kind of procession in which we are the captives. Christ is the victorious one, and we have been taken captive, as it were, and that we are, in that sense, the prisoners or the slaves who follow Christ into death. That's the kind of procession we're in. It's Christ's victory, not our victory. Christ's victory. And we follow Christ into victory by being led to death. Or as Paul will talk about it in chapter four, you know, we bear the marks, we bear the, the death of Christ in our bodies. Death, suffering. So Paul is hinting at here that sort of, we're, we're in a procession, yes, but we're sufferers in this triumphal procession of Christ. But God does a second thing. God spreads the aroma of Christ through us. We become the instruments by which people smell Christ. And it can sound kind of crass, but aroma might have something to do with the aroma of the incense and the procession, or it might have something to do with the aroma of the pleasing sacrifice where animals are sacrificed to God and the incense that's given at the sacrifice and that that's an aroma that pleases God or honors God. And that we are, we are the way in which people smell Christ. And if we 
do that in an honorable way, if we do that with integrity, if we do that committed and grounded in the gospel, it will be a saving aroma to those who, who have, who have smell that message of beauty and joy and love and peace from us. It will bring them life. But there are others who it brings them death because they reject that message. So we are a kind of people who are living in the world, giving off a smell. And that smell has an effect on people. If we have the aroma of Christ, not everybody's going to accept that message. Not everybody wants to be in a procession of slaves who are going to death for the sake of the ministry of the gospel, to follow Christ to the cross. But some will. And to those who are being saved, it is about life. And those who are perishing, it's about death. I, I fear that um, a lot of the aroma Christians give off these days kind of stinks up the place. That we don't have the aroma of a beauty. We don't have the aroma of a fragrance that is attractive and inviting and welcoming and soothing, peaceful. Rather, we have an aroma that is filled with polemics and argument and debate and hypocrisy and deceitfulness and anger. And if that's the aroma we, we give off, it stinks. And it's not an aroma that leads to life. So as we thank God for the one, because God leads us in this procession in Christ, and that in Christ, God spreads the aroma of Christ through us, we become the instruments by which God pours that aroma, that fragrance into our world. We have to pay attention to who we are. And that's why Paul says, well, who's sufficient for that? Who can be qualified for that? Who's competent for that? Who's adequate for that? And, and I think the question is posed in a way that um, maybe expects a no answer. But actually, Paul's going to give a yes answer. There is a, there is a competency. But it's not a competency that comes from ourselves. It's not a competency because we're so great at it, because we're so wonderful. It's not a competency based upon our abilities and capacities. It's rather a competency that comes from God, as we'll see in verses 3 to 6 in chapter 3. But the contrast Paul draws here is probably the contrast that, that applies to the Corinthians in their situation. Because you remember, one of the problems they have with Paul is that he doesn't take patronage. He doesn't want to get paid for what he's doing. And they think that's pretty strange. That just doesn't fit our culture. I mean, a person who thinks they're doing something good and worthwhile and informative and formative for people, like teachers or philosophers, they take patronage. And to refuse patronage is to kind of say, well, maybe you're, you, know, you get what you pay for. You don't measure up in some way. You're not worthy to have a patron. And now other people have come into play in Corinth that apparently are willing to take pay. They are willing to, to take some patronage. And Paul draws this contrast in the last verse of chapter 2 between the peddlers of the word of God, the adulterators of the word of God, those who make the word of God a marketplace, something to sell, something to enrich themselves with. That they're, at, they're about selfish ambitions. They're about the ambition of wealth and power. And Paul says, we are not like some are. So many, he says, which probably alludes to the practices in Corinth or maybe beyond in the Greco-Roman world. Like so many, they peddle the word of God. They're just in it for the money. They're just in it. They, they, they use this as a means of, um, of self-aggrandizement and power, and status, and wealth. Paul says, that's not me. 
I don't, I don't proclaim the gospel. I don't spread the fragrance for selfish ambition, to have prosperity, to have wealth as a sign of God has blessed me in some way. Rather, out of sincerity, I speak as one who has been sent from God and one who stands in the presence of God. My ministry is rooted in God. I come from God. And when I speak, I speak in the presence of God. And when I speak, I speak as one who is sincere, who is dedicated, who is focused with integrity upon the message. And that's why I suffer. So who is sufficient? The one who's sent from God. And the one who speaks standing in the presence of God. And the one who speaks with integrity and sincerity. Not because they have somehow accumulated and produced this sufficiency in themselves. No, this sufficiency or this competency or this adequacy has come from God. And that is the one who is sufficient. And Paul, Paul says, let me, let me speak a word to that. and Look at yourselves. I know there are a lot of people, in, particularly in the Greco-Roman world, who use letters of recommendation. I mean, it was very common back then. It's common today. And I get a lot of requests from former students uh, for letters of recommendation, which is fine. That's one of the ways we introduce ourselves to other people. I may not know this person, or I may not know this institution, but I get a letter from a mutual friend or a well-recognized institution or something like that, that, that the person would recognize and trust. And I recommend, and I seek that as one who wants to be recommended. I, I ask a friend to write for the sake of recommending me. And this was apparently practiced among the churches. I mean, Paul in, second, in Romans chapter 16, verse 1 says, you know, I commend Phoebe. Um, this, is part, this is a letter of recommendation for Phoebe. That's part of the function there at the end of Romans. So this is not an unusual thing. It's not like um, this is a bad thing. No, letters of recommendation are, are good things. Paul practices that, like with Phoebe. However, with Corinth, Paul said, do I, do, I need a, do I need a letter of recommendation for you? I mean, do I need to bring with me some letters from Jerusalem or letters from other churches? Or do I need to bring letters of recommendation to you? Do you need that from me? Yeah, these other people may have brought some. Maybe they have letters of recommendation. And, and maybe that for some people, oh, well. This, this guy's more important, or maybe we should listen to him or her. What, whatever it is, those letters seem to have persuaded some people. He's got a letter of recommendation. Paul doesn't. And so Paul says, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. I, I don't need to bring a letter. You are the letter. And you're written on my heart, our heart, Paul says. Now, some translations say your heart, written on your heart. And there's a textual problem here. Some Greek manuscripts have your and some majority. And uh, the most um, uh, credible, it would seem, have our. And our is the most difficult reading here because your makes, seems to make more sense. But our, why would you replace yours with ours? It's our letter. Our, I mean, your, our letter written on our hearts. You are our letter written on our hearts. I was there when you were founded. I, I know who you are. I know the changes that occurred. I know the transformation of people. I saw what happened. I experienced it. I was there when the church was planted. You have been written in my heart. 
And everywhere I go, people can read and know about you because I brag about you. I talk about you, about what God did in Corinth. You are my letter of recommendation. I don't have to go to Ephesus and bring a letter. I just go to Ephesus and tell your story. <laughs> you are my recommendation. You are our letter. And this letter was not written by some other congregation. It wasn't written by the church in Jerusalem. It wasn't even written by me particularly. I was the instrument of this letter. I was the one who administered it or ministered it to you so that through me, the aroma of Christ was spread, so that through me, Christ wrote on your heart. Christ wrote the letter by the Spirit of God. It's a letter that, that was written not with ink on papyrus or not etched out on a stone so that it's some kind of external reality and a letter you can hold in your hands. No, it's a letter you hold in your heart. And Christ has written this letter in my heart and also in your heart. Because when Christ wrote it in your heart, through me that I administered, through the ministry of reconciliation, through the preaching of the gospel in Corinth, Christ wrote a letter in my heart and in your heart. You are the letter of recommendation. You are my letter of recommendation. And you are also, you are also the tablet upon which Jesus wrote in your heart by the Spirit of God. It wasn't with ink, it was by the Spirit of God. And it wasn't on a tablet of stone, it was on the human heart. I don't think the contrast here is, is uh, when you say tablet, when, we, when Paul says tablets of stone, I don't think the contrast is, okay, the law of Moses is bad, that's Ten Commandments, that's bad stuff, that's old stuff, we don't do that anymore. We have this. No, I, I think, as we'll see more later on in the next section of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll see that Paul values the law. Paul doesn't dismiss the tablets of stone. He doesn't say, eh, that's bad stuff. In fact, the tablets of stone were written by the finger of God. And the finger of God etched in this glorious moment at Sinai, God its own finger etched the law on the tablets. That's a glorious thing. That's a good thing. But what Paul is saying here is that something more, not something that replaces, but something that extends, because now that law is not written on just stone, it is now written in our hearts, which is exactly the, the thing that Jeremiah talks about in Jeremiah 31. The law is written on our hearts. It's written by the Spirit of God rather than etched in a stone. It's not something simply external. Because if it's ex simply external, it's just a letter. It's an external letter. It's an external tablet. It's out there. It's outside of me. And if that's all it is, it kills us. Because it's a burden. It's laid upon us in which we are incapable of fully realizing in our lives or living out in our lives. What we need is not only the letter. We still need the letter. We still need the Ten Commandments. We still need the letter of love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's part of the letter. It's part of Scripture. The letter is a good thing. But if it's the only thing, it kills because what we need is the Spirit of God to etch the, etch the law on our hearts 
We need the spirit of God to write not with ink, but upon our hearts. And the spirit then gives life. So it's not either letter or spirit. It's rather both letter and spirit. Letter alone kills. It gives off death. But spirit and letter, or the letter written by the spirit upon our hearts, not just in the externals of the tablets, the letter written by the spirit on our hearts gives life and empowers us to live. That's the ministry of the new covenant that Jeremiah talked about in Jeremiah 31, or Ezekiel talked about in Ezekiel 36. The fact that and we'll have a new spirit and a new heart, and that God will write it not on the tablets in Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 11, if I remember right, but we'll write it on the hearts of flesh, which is the language Paul uses here. The New RSV translates it as uh, human hearts, but it's the hearts, hearts of flesh. Even, even in Deuteronomy, this was what the call was to circumcise our hearts. God has always wanted circumcised hearts. God has always wanted the heart engaged, not just the law, not just the letter, but the heart. And the new covenant, the ministry of the new covenant is a ministry by which the spirit writes the law on our hearts. And we become letters of recommendation. We become a means by which the fragrance of Christ is spread because the law written on our hearts works on us from the inside out so that what flows out from the inside out when we have a heart upon which God has written the law, the fruit of the Spirit comes out. We bear life. We bring life. And we live life inside and out but if all we have is the letter no circumcision of the heart no writing of the spirit upon our heart if all we have is the letter then it kills this is why the ministry of the new covenant is so important this is what preaching the gospel is about this is what the aroma of christ brings into our, our purview so that we can see the beauty and live the life and love with the love of God because the Spirit of God is written on our hearts. And this is why we are competent. As Paul says, we're not claiming to be competent of ourselves. We can't do this writing. I can't write on the heart. The Spirit of God writes on the heart. I can't write on your heart. But the Spirit of God, through the fragrance that I give off in terms of the aroma of Christ, through me, through me, through my spreading of the aroma of Christ, because the Spirit is at work within me, through me, the Spirit of God can write on your heart. And that's why we're competent. I know sometimes it seems like we're, we're incompetent, that it's frustrating, that we're not sufficient, that we don't have enough, that, that we're inadequate. And, and there's a sense in which we ought to feel inadequate because if we're looking at ourselves only, if we're thinking about who we are and only who we are, yeah, we are inadequate. I can't write on your heart. Only the Spirit of God can do that. I'm inadequate for that. But I am adequate because of who God is and what God is doing through me and through you. We are competent. Within the ministry of the new covenant, we are competent to be the instruments of God through whom God writes on the hearts of others. As Paul says, thanks be to God, right? Thanks be to God who in Christ leads us in triumphal procession.
we're a part of this, this movement. We are, we have been captured by the gospel of Christ and we live under the obligation of the gospel of Christ. And we are compelled by the gospel of Christ. Even all the way to death at the end of the procession. And so Paul says, that's why I suffer. Because I'm following Christ. Thanks be to God who in Christ leads us in a triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God. We are competent. We are sufficient because it is God who leads us and it is God who spreads the fragrance through us. It is God who writes on the hearts of those around us. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit